Hey everyone, this is Andrew from Silent 7 Games. I just wanted to go show you a quick early look at a just for fun TCG I've been working on called Soul Card. So I got some components in from the Game Crafter. I've got enough cards to fool around with the game a little bit and I want to show off uh, some of what I've got and just a glimpse of how the game works. Quick overview. So here we have the Feral Dodo of Determination. That is a sample of a champion in the game. Uh, in the game you'll get to choose a trait card, a unit card, and a sobriquet card and combine them to form a champion. You will form three champions uh, in order to have a complete team. So here we also have the Angry Acolyte, Friend of Raven, and the Bow-Wielding Militia with a Magic Leaf. And you could mix and match those cards however you wanted in order to build your own team. Uh, each three card set, like I said, is called a champion. And these nine cards that I've shown you are the starting cards. So you'll actually get a set of these white bordered cards and the exact same cards in black border uh, in order to play a starter versus starter game uh, with an opponent. And you'll also use those starting cards for the limited. So if you want to play a draft or sealed format, you can play draft with one booster pack or sealed with two booster packs, one for each player. And in each case, you will have these starter cards around uh, to kind of fill out the slots that your booster pack contents didn't give you. So the way you actually play the game is you're going to represent each of your champions on the board with um, a standee of some kind. So if you've got a miniature, you could use that instead. The two-player starter set will come with standees for all the possible characters that you could get out of booster packs. So you'll have everything you need to play and then the booster packs will just supplement with that with the cards themselves. So these standees are temporary prototypes. Hopefully the final standees will be uh, kind of all punch board. But that's yet to be determined. Like I said, a lot of this is still up in the air. Also this map is clearly not the final quality. So here we've set up the map with a three on three. The champions on the other side, I'll just show you a quick glance now these are some samples of some full cards, not the starter cards, so this would be a very lopsided battle. But there's the Stalking Wolf of Basilisk's Touch, there's some fireworks, You've got Savage Orc Who Slays Kings, a Fiery Mage from the Core, and there's a, uh, just for fun, there's this fourth champion that wouldn't be in the battle here, but it's a Spectral Bear of the Bro Broken Oath. So here you can see Spectral is an Arcane card, Bear is a Primal card, and of the Broken Oath is a Martial card, and I'm still not decided how much you can mix those around. So here you got to see all primal, all militia, uh, martial, and all arcane. And this is a mix of the three. So in draft and sealed, for sure, you'd be able to mix them however you want. For constructed play, where you're building your own teams, I haven't yet decided uh, exactly what the rules for that would be. It's kind of fun to mix them all up, but it's also kind of more thematic and possibly more balanced to uh, force you to make a themed champion. So I failed to bring any dice to the table right now, but the game is very much uh, focused on dice. So you're gonna, each player would start with three, and you'll roll three at the start of your turn. And those are your actions for the turn. So as you can see, a champion has the trait card gives you two dice powers. One can be activated with a one, and the other can be activated with a two. Uh, the unit card always gives you dice powers for the three and four, and the sobriquet card always gives you dice powers for the five and the six. So you can use any die to move any one of your champions two spaces. And a space is just one that's next to the champion's current position. So right now, you can see the militia is here, you'd be next to this one, and that one, and that one. So you could go one, two, for example, uh, with one die. And then, let's see, the militia is a boat wielding militia, so he actually has the ranged attack release. So if I had a two, I could use that, although it's only ranged three, and he wouldn't quite be in range of any of the opponents. He's closest to the orc, but the orc is four away. So that's an example of uh, how you might use a dice power. You would put the dice that you use to activate the, the champion uh, next to the champion to show that they've already 
done something, they can each champion can move once and use one die power. So can't use two dice powers, can't move twice, but you can do both, and you can do them in either order, and you can even mix up with the rest of your team. So you're activating as a whole team, so you could, for example, maybe move the militia, then activate a power of the acolyte, and then go back and use the power of the militia. We got a bunch of tokens here. Those come into play with special abilities. So we got these poisons uh, that actually come into effect from that of Basilisk's touch that the Stalking Wolf had. Uh, I have some fire. Fire tokens actually get placed down on the map and make champions take damage for moving through them. And the most common ones will probably be these, these Temp Armor tokens. These uh, increase the value your opponent rolls or needs to roll in order to deal damage. And then the Temp Damage tokens increase the number of dice you roll when you make an attack. Each of the powers, for example, we could take a look at this um, let's look at Burden on the Of Determination card. So it's a melee power, meaning uh, the champion that's going to use it needs to be adjacent to the victim that is going to be targeting. And the four means you will roll four dice, uh, four damage dice. Uh, in this game, you will hit on a 4, 5, or 6 in order to deal one point of damage. In addition, you can you give up one of the dice in order to add three to another one. So even if you roll all ones, twos, and threes on those four dice when you're using the burden power, you could still use two of them to give the other two plus three, bringing them up to 4, 5, or 6. So basically that means a four die attack is guaranteed to do at least two damage. Uh, the armor actually is what gets in the middle of that and can, since it would increase the value you need to hit from 4, 5, or 6 up to 5 or 6, the plus 3 might not help, but it probably will still be unless you just rolled all 1s. But, so basically your 4 dice you're pretty much guaranteed to do at least 2 damage. Although you can have multiple armor tokens and maybe now your opponent needs a 6 to hit and, and so on. But four dice is still a good amount. You can do you're gonna do two to four damage for the most part. And that brings us to the health. So you can see that Dodo has three hearts on it, and of determination has one, and Feral has zero. Those are the hit points. So Feral Dodo of Determination basically has four hit points. And for each damage that it takes, it's gonna put one of these oversized red gems onto it. Um the final ones will be smaller, but so when all four hearts are covered up, that would be a dead dodo. And you just remove it from the map. That means you're gonna have one fewer champion to use for the rest of the battle, but you're still gonna, still gonna have the same number of dice, so you can have your other characters uh, activating. Also, whenever you use a power of a champion, you're gonna take some exhaustion tokens and the fives and sixes have two dots on them. That means they're going to take two exhaustion after using the power. And the threes and fours have one, and the ones and twos have zero. So the fi fives and sixes tend to be more powerful, but they make the champion take more exhaustion. While the ones and twos are not as powerful effects, but they don't uh, incur any exhaustion. Then. So another use for a die, you can use any value of die to do this, is to remove one exhaustion from each of your champions. So as you activate and you're adding exhaustion tokens to them for doing so, you can, you'll can you need to spend dice to activate them again to use more powers. So you might use the chant power of your acolyte, and that's going to give her one exhaustion. It doesn't prevent her from moving later in that turn, but on a future turn, she won't be able to move or activate a power because she has exhaustion, but exhaustion used in a given turn doesn't really kick in until the end of that turn, so uh, you're not prevented from moving that same turn. In the same way, uh, movement incurs one exhaustion, but that doesn't prevent you from activating in that same turn. 
So I think that's most of what's going on here, um, at least on the cards. One last thing I'll do real quick is this symbol is a skill symbol. Uh, this chant power has one skill icon, and that means that the angry acolyte friend of Raven can have one card in her skill set, and that would be this one. So this is the one I selected here. This is also a starter card, so there are some more starter uh, skills over here, courage, bomb, and arrow. You can put any card you want in your skill set. So when you're building your team, if you've got one skill icon, you could put any card in the entire game into the skill set. However, chant says perform an arcane skill. The only way to actually use a card from your skill set is to have a power that says so. So chant says that the acolyte can perform an arcane skill. So you would need to have an arcane skill in the skill set to benefit from that activation. And since the chant only lets her put one card in her skill set, you would want that to be arcane. Um, and none of her other cards add anything to the skill set, but if you did have multiple cards that added to your skill set, you could have a bigger skill set built up because of that. For example, the Fiery Mage from the core has the Excel, um, the Acolyte, spelled differently as a pun, but that gives one card in the skill set, and then the Sorcery skill or power actually gives three skills. So her skill set would be a total of four cards. And again, those can be any four cards you want, but you want to make sure to select ones that your powers actually will let you use. The exception to that is actually these starter cards, because you never know what team you're going to end up when you're playing sealed or drafting, and so you want to make sure you have some skills you can use. So these all have the basic ability. The arrow, the bomb, and courage all have the basic ability, which means if a champ could perform any skill, they can perform this one instead. It's kind of a catch-all. Any kind of skill set power you have, if your power is going to let you perform a skill, you could perform one of these basic skills. And then they have different effects, so Arrow just lets me make a range 2 attack with 2 dice, which is not particularly strong, but there you go. And Bomb is a single use that actually says to retire it after using it. And does a big blast that might even hurt your allies. But at the beginning of the game, your opponent won't know what card is in the skill set. Also, the Friend of Raven has this health, health point that is covering up 2 uh, powers. If a heart is on a power, that means if that heart takes damage, the power that it's on is no longer available. And since this heart is on two different powers, uh, that would deactivate both of them. Uh, yeah, thematically here, you've got a, a bird that, if it sacrifices itself, you've got to take the wound on that specific heart, and that would mean you can't use any of those uh, bird-related powers anymore. Uh, but then you've got, like, the militia, who has the swing power, and there's a heart just right on that one power, so if you take that wound, he won't be able to swing anymore, but he will still be able to axe spin. The heart behind axe spin is not on top of axe spin, so uh, it, it has no relation to that. It's just a graphic element. So the final thing is kind of going to be on the map here. You'll be moving around, and you need to be in a position to use your ranged and your melee attacks against your enemies. Um, you will have... Uh, these relics out on the board. So each player is going to start with a stack of three relics. You're required to have one arcane relic, one primal relic, and one martial relic. And you just shuffle them up and pull one at the beginning of the game. Here we have pulled the arcane orb and the enemy has pulled a primal fruit. And then you represent those out on the board with some tokens, which will probably be punch board. But right now there's these glass beads that do not match their colors. Uh, but this is the the Primal Fruit, and the Arcane Orb. And if your character moves onto one of those, you get to claim it. And a couple things happen. You'll take the card. So let's say I did move the Militia onto the Arcane Orb. I'll claim it. I will claim this card. I'm going to draw a new card from my stack. So now we get out of two Primal Fruits out at the same time, which is totally fine. And then those two positions are the initial placements of the relics. But whenever one is taken, you replace it by rolling a die, and then the new relic appears in one of these six positions depending on the die roll. So you never know where the next relic is going to come out. It's always, um, always random. And another thing happens, which is that both players, not just the player who claimed the relic, both players will get an extra die 
And since players both start with three dice, uh, they'll now be up to four. Uh, and then when two relics have been claimed, both players will have five dice every turn and so on. And those are dice that you get to roll at the start of your turn. So if you claim a relic, you're not going to get to benefit from that die immediately, but your opponent is going to get their bonus die right away. So you've got to time your relics right, because when you get a relic, your opponent's immediately going to have one more action than you had on your turn. But the reason you want to get relics, one is they've got a little ability, which I'll cover in a second, but once all six relics have been claimed, the player who got the most wins. And if it's a tie, since there are six of them, then it is the player who got the last one. So there's a little bit of strategy there about when you get them, when you let your opponent get them, when you focus on getting them, and when you focus on defeating your opponent's champions, because the other way to win is just to defeat all of your opponent's champions. And so you want to keep an eye out for that. The rules for that might still be in flux. I'll have to test it some to make sure that that, that works out right. But the point is that these are going to be objectives that you care about, that your opponent cares about, and is a way to win the game. Uh, finally, the, the, the ability that you get that kind of is the benefit, because you're giving your opponent a die right away, and you may or may not end up with the most, but you do get this ability that the die that you get, your opponent's die just is a generic die, but the die that you get actually matches the relic that you claimed. So this arcane orb is an arcane relic, meaning you're going to die that matches, that is an arcane die, basically. And when you'll need to track which of your dice belongs to that relic, because when you activate one of your powers with that particular die, if it was an arcane power, the champion takes one less fatigue at the end of the turn, meaning maybe if you moved, you don't suffer that fatigue. If you used a three or a four, you don't suffer that fatigue. If you used a five or a six, you only suffer one instead of two. Um, it's just one less overall for the whole turn, but that's still a pretty, uh, pretty notable effect. And the different relics just match that, uh, that type. So the primal relic gives you a, basically a primal die that lessens the fatigue for primal powers. And the way you would can tell if it's a primal power or a martial power and so on is that it's uh, the color. So chant here is an arcane power. The starter cards actually have a lot of neutral powers that don't benefit from any of the relics. So you, they're not very strong cards. They're meant to be replaced or just for your starter game. And you can see the militia has one martial power, but it's got to be a four. And, you know, they're all fours, and Dodo has the primal one. So that's pretty much it. Um, oh, here I've got, just for fun, here are some more skills. These are the skills that aren't the starter ones. So these are all arcane skills. Still trying to decide for the set if I want all the skills to be arcane, at least for the first set, or maybe I'll have some primers, primal skills mixed in. Uh, probably no martial skills, but we'll see. Things like stances and special maneuvers could be interesting. I just want to kind of give the skill mechanic a little bit more focus, at least for the first set, and then maybe expand it if we, if we make more sets. So we got Chance Eye that lets you manipulate your dice a little bit. We got Chill that is a ranged attack that could potentially hit multiple enemies. And um, Cinder Storm is just a big blast of fire. So anyway, I think that's it for now. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Like I said, it's still in development. There is a tabletop simulator module. Um, I was a little scattered with this explanation, so you may or may not know enough at this point to actually try out a game. But if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I wrote about half of a rule book, so hopefully I'll finish that relatively soon, and, and that would let people play on a tabletop simulator module. I think all or most of the cards that I showed here are in tabletop simulator, and hopefully I'll have more cards soon. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.